And now we're at Lord Roberts. And Lord Roberts was the Commander-in-Chief of the Forces after Viscount Wolseley. And he is dressed on for a cold campaign in his patrol jacket lined in fur. So he has a, a different disposition than, uh, than Sir Garnet. And just like Sir Garnet, his career is peppered with all of the great campaigns of the Victorian era. So let's go to the back of his plinth to read about it. He's born in 1832, died in France in 1914. Um, he's commander-in-chief in India, 1885 to 93. Um, commander-in-chief of the British Army for four years, 1901 to 1904. Now as a young lieutenant, he actually wins the Victoria Cross, Britain's highest military honor. And of course, the bronze is cast from cannons. We always have to swing back around to the cannon, and people often thought that it was from Russian cannons from the Crimean War, and we're pretty sure now that they're actually captured Chinese cannons that were used. Now, as a young lieutenant, he recovered the colors alone on his horse with just his sword, and that act of gallantry won him the Victoria Cross. He's also mentioned in dispatches and is just generally a very brave and accomplished young officer in the Indian Mutiny. Umbaila, 1863. And the Umbaila expedition is in the border areas between British India and Afghanistan. Uh, there had been a number of incursions by Pashtuns down into British India, and this was a campaign in that area to sort of settle the border. The Abyssinian campaign was a punitive expedition, which involved um, a number of British missionaries being taken hostage, and British forces were sent in to um, defeat the Abyssinian, the Ethiopian forces, go into the capital, and um, relieve the hostages, and all of the, uh, the mission was accomplished. Um, Lushai in 1871-72, because the Mizo people, then known as the Lushai in Mizoram in northeast India, had attacked Assam, had taken a number of European prisoners in India, and this was a punitive and rescue expedition um, against them. And Afghanistan in 1878, which is the second Anglo-Afghan War, and Lord Roberts was the chief architect of the second phase of the war. There were two main phases, and I, like every historian, I have to back all the way up, and I'm very partial to the Afghan question and the Great Game, so bear with me. So the Great Game describes the Victorian Cold War, the struggle for Central Asia between Russia and Britain, Russia wanting to expand into Central Asia and Turkestan, potentially into Persia, and the British wanting to expand out of India, but also to protect British India from incursions north from the Russians. And this mistrust and continued posturing in Persia and Afghanistan just led to this Cold War, this, this Victorian Cold War. Throughout the Great Game, you have people... Uh, this is even very relevant today. You have people that are of the opinion that we should be in a forward school where Afghanistan needs to be held and directly controlled as a buffer state, whereas many people preferred the hands-off approach. Having Afghanistan, difficult as it is to control and conquer, be someone else's problem and serve as that buffer state between uh, Russian Turkestan, British India, and Persia. So in the 1840s, taking a more proactive approach, the British invaded Afghanistan, um, and I will probably go into that a different episode, but it resulted in a disastrous retreat from Kabul, led by General Elphinstone, and uh, famously we have the 44th, the last stand of the 44th, in the Khyber Pass at Gandamak. And I mentioned Gandamak because we're going to come back to it. The... Second Afghan War occurs in 1878, 1878 to 1880. Now, Dost Muhammad Khan was left on the throne after the British attempted to install Shah Shuja, 
uh, he comes back to the throne and rules, and it's eventually his son, Sher Ali Khan, who the British are dealing with yet again in the 1870s. And fearful of a Russian incursion, the British keep wanting to send a formal mission to Kabul. And in 1878, that mission is denied, the British are turned away at the border, and a Russian mission is brought to Afghanistan, and the Afghans rescind any previous agreements, and fearful of a Russian forward policy, the British send a column to Kabul. And that's the first invasion force, and that's actually led by General Sam Brown, who probably anyone in military or police circles knows because of his belt. Brown lost his arm to a sword slash in the Indian Mutiny, and he needed something to hold the scabbard steady so he could draw his sword one-handed, and thus the iconic Sam Brown belt. But he successfully goes into Kabul, and a British mission is installed. Um, Sher Ali Khan is forced to leave the country, and his son, Muhammad Yaqub, declares himself the, the new emir, and he signs a new treaty with the British. He signs the Treaty of Gandamak, and this is Sir Pierre Louis Napoleon Cavignari, and he's an Italian-British administrative figure in the British Raj and in the Great Game. And I always love his resting smug face. And he secures that treaty, secures that mission, that permanent presence, e even if a diplomatic one, um, you know, an embassy with perhaps a hundred soldiers in it in Afghanistan. However, within a few months, they are all murdered. I actually just saw the statue of Lieutenant Hamilton defending the residency in Kabul. The uh, statue was originally in Dublin, but it was moved to the National Army Museum in Chelsea. And Lieutenant Hamilton was killed defending the residency and awarded the Victoria Cross of the 75 or so defenders, there were only three that survived. So following the massacre of the British mission, a second force was sent to Kabul, and that was led by Lord Roberts. And Lord Roberts moved on Kabul, and he, like Elphinstone, camped in a cantonment outside of Kabul, and he too was placed under siege by the Afghans in the area, uh, vastly outnumbering their force. And the defense of the Sherpa cantonment was successful, unlike Elphinstone, who in 1842 sort of lost his nerve and decided to retreat from Kabul. So after successfully taking Kabul, thwarting the Afghan forces in the north, there was a major British disaster in the south, and that's the Battle of Maiwand, and that is still very present in the Afghan psyche. And I think that's one thing that we, it's tragic that it's not part of our understanding in the West of Afghanistan, because it is a cultural icon that, even, even though the Afghans did take quite a few casualties, they killed a thousand British soldiers at this battle, and the colors of the 66th, were lost. In fact, the British would never again bring colors into battle because, you know, twice in the same year at Asantawana and at Maiwand, the regimental colors were lost. And the Battle of Maiwand is about 2,500 British and Indian soldiers against 25,000 Afghans. But at the Battle of Maiwand, Afghan legend has it that Malalai, a young girl, threw off her veil and led the soldiers who were wavering into battle and led them to victory. In fact, Malalai is the namesake of Malala Yousafzai. Malalai is still very much a part of Afghan culture, and it is fascinating to recognize what a long memory and what intricate threads are woven in the culture and cultural memory of the peoples of Central Asia. So after the disaster at Maiwand, the remainder of the force falls back on Kandahar and Muhammad Ayyub, um, the brother of Muhammad Yaqub and another son of Sher Ali Khan, places Kandahar under siege and Lord Roberts takes a column down from Kabul south towards Kandahar. 
and he makes a nearly 400 mile march in about 20 days in the searing heat and he takes an elite force of highlanders and gurkhas sikhs and punjabi cavalry down through this difficult terrain from kabul to kandahar and defeats muhammad ayub outside kandahar and lord roberts would eventually be known as lord roberts of kandahar and following that victory the british install Abdur Rahman Khan on the throne, another grandson of Dost Muhammad, but they install him. He submits to the Treaty of Gandamak. The territorial changes happen. Afghanistan becomes a protectorate, and foreign affairs are relegated to the realm of the British. He also eventually agrees to the Duran Line, which formally sets the border between Afghanistan and British India, because throughout the 19th century, Everyone has a different map of Central Asia. The Russians think the border's somewhere, the Afghans think the border's somewhere, the Persians, the British, everyone has a different map and a different opinion of where certain borders end or whether there's a border at all. And continuing the story with Lord Robert's career, Burma in 1886, this is the third Anglo-Burmese war, and eventually it places Burma directly under the control of British India. It's subsumed into British India. And this was particularly notable in Lord Robert's career because Burmese resistance lasted for at least a decade, and his policy involved a series of small outposts throughout the country, which I think eventually influenced his handling of insurgency in South Africa. And that brings us to the next one, the Boer War. Now, he's probably most famous for taking over from Sir Redvers Buller after the Black Week in um, the Second Boer War, because there had been a series of disasters, and he was brought in as the new field commander of British forces in South Africa. He relieved the Siege of Kimberley, and, and he led the British Army to a number of victories, which resulted in the surrender of the Boers. Now, getting into the controversial parts of his service, Lord Roberts was instrumental in the introduction of concentration camps for the Boer. Rather than fighting a traditional open war, the Boers were fighting in guerrilla-style commandos. And, and in order to combat that, the British went after their towns, their farms, and concentrated the people that had been spread out all over the countryside supporting these various commandos into single defensible locations. And many of the Boers in these concentration camps died as a result of the conditions, though the Boers themselves were no strangers to atrocities. As commander-in-chief of the forces, he was a proponent of the introduction of the SMLE, the short model E Enfield. And I think this is such a fascinating time, because think, as an army officer, he's gone from the era of the rifle musket, where you are muzzle loading you are pouring powder pushing the bullet down to the bottom of the barrel and firing it out and then he sees the transition to the snyder where we have that cartridge and the breech actually opens up then the martini henry where you're firing even more rounds and very accurately and then by the boer war you have the modern small bore rifle and just the transition between those two eras he really saw such a profound movement, where, where he would have seen troops using brown bests. Many of the Sepoy soldiers still had brown bests in the 1850s. Most of them did have percussion, but still brown bests nonetheless. And he ends his career introducing the short model Lee Enfield, with its flat trajectory, incredible firepower, and incredible rate of fire. We know those instructors at the School of Musketry used that rifle to do their Mad Minute, which of course you should check out my friend Brett on paper cartridges doing the Mad Minute with his various firearms. And Rob with the British muzzleloaders, who has a great deal of SMLE history and also demonstrates the Mad Minute over in Canada. And back to Lord Roberts, he was particularly a proponent of preparation for national service, the National Service League he had been talking for years about how the Germans were preparing for national service. And just like we saw with the volunteer movement and the creation of the Territorial Army, he was a proponent of these national service leagues, which would teach even a lower level of common citizen to shoot 
should the army be called upon, and then the territorial army and the reserves called up, what would be the next step if there was a general conscription? He felt that the country as a whole needed to be better prepared, and that even citizens that had no inclination for military service perhaps should be prepared to be called up. And that's a little prophetic for the First World War when we know the very small professional core of the British Army were absolutely decimated in the first months of the war. Mass conscription needs to happen, and the men and boys that were called up had absolutely no experience and had so little time for training. Now, Lord Roberts here was of, he was born in India, but he was of Anglo-Irish descent. So he has a, a great deal of connection to Ireland, actually gets involved in a lot of the political struggles supporting the Unionists and being very politically vocal during the plans for home rule before the Easter Rising and the Irish Civil War. Below Lord Roberts is a figure of near equal celebrity, Volinal. And Volinal was Lord Roberts' mount, and he acquired him in India during the Lashai expedition, and it was, he was actually named after one of the Lashai chiefs. Volinal was apparently Lord Roberts' most reliable steed, and he carried him on the difficult trek from Kabul to Kandahar. Volinal was actually thrice decorated by Her Majesty Queen Victoria, first with the Afghan medal, then with the Kabul to Kandahar medal, and lastly the Jubilee medal, and Volinal actually walked in the Jubilee in 1897, with Lord Roberts tagging along atop him. He brought him back to Ireland, and he's buried there. He died in 1899. Another of our great Victorian generals. Now, I won't pass any comment, but Horse Guards Parade was a civil service car park for most of the late 20th century and there were efforts made to make sure no one parked here but there are some naughty individuals who have been parking here ruining my sand crunching but um <laughs> that uh it makes it a little less serene when there are so many vehicles everywhere. But I suppose someone very important needs to park here to do their job. So, just the historian complaining. Don't listen to me. We have one more episode here in Horse Guards Parade. Two statues and one tremendous thing. So stay tuned for that.